Arkadaşlar merhaba Kripto Emre'ye hepiniz hoş geldiniz. Bugün de sizler için acayip özel bir konuğum var. Algorand'da ürünün başında olan Nabil İhsanullah bizimle. Biz kendisiyle aslında İstanbul'da tanışmıştık ama şimdi sözü ona vereceğim. O da biraz kendinden bahsetsin. Biraz da işte Algorand'da neler oluyor bitiyor hep beraber konuşalım. Alt yazılarımız olacak onları YouTube'dan açmayı unutmayın. Çünkü İngilizce yapacağız. Röportajı. Uh, good morning, Navid. Uh, thanks for joining me. So, how are you? How are things back in Boston? Doing well. Everything's great. Uh, I think the uh, whole uh, quarantine COVID life is different. And um, even after these number of months, it takes some getting used to. Um, but still, we're managing and uh, being productive. So, we're pretty happy. Yeah. So, I was just mentioning in Turkish that, I mean, you and I were supposed to meet when you were in Istanbul for the blockchain mm -hmm. economy uh, right. conference. Yeah, but yeah, we didn't get to meet back then. But you know, there's this saying: it's better than late than never. So uh, here we are. Um, okay. So I mean, before we begin, I'd really like to uh, know a bit about you. I mean, how you got into crypto? If you can yeah. tell us a little about your background and what you do at Algorand. Yeah, totally. So I, uh, I think uh, maybe the. I'm not going to start from the very beginning. That would be boring. But uh, backing up a couple of uh, um, years to. Um, 2008 is probably relevant. Uh, back then, I was a uh, working at a company called Bit9. It's been acquired a couple of times, became Carbon Black, uh, and now VMware owns it. Um, their model at that company was uh, their security, anti-malware, a whitelisting, and I was a architect there. Um, and in that space, that's really right around the time that uh, Bitcoin um, happened. So this is 11 plus years ago. And uh, that's when I first heard about it. I was already in the security world, so uh, crypto security kind of go hand in hand. And that's when I first uh, heard about that white paper and, and read it. But I, unfortunately for myself, didn't do much more beyond uh, read the white paper at that time. Uh, I was too busy running uh, you know, our uh, global software repository and um, working on that, um, on that job. So for the past four to a couple of years, I uh, um, moved on from Bit9 to uh, a company called Mozilla, which many people have probably heard of. They create the Firefox web browser. I ran a number of engineering teams there, including security, networking, JavaScript. Uh, we created WebAssembly. Uh, so it's one of the sort of amazing, cool things I had a hand in. And uh, um, while at Mozilla, I was also uh, responsible for some company-wide um, projects, including the quantum performance project. Um, it was in this time uh, that I finally had a little bit more um, time to mess around with mining, setting up mining rigs in my basement, which were crazy loud, um, buying GPU cards, <laughs> which were really expensive, just to uh, you know sort of follow that trend. This is before the day of where ASICs make, made all that redundant. Uh, uh, so I understood a lot more about what crypto mechanically looked like. And I was still much more interested in it from a computer science perspective and sort of a hobbyist gearhead perspective, but not in the um, crypto is going to rev revolutionize finance way. At that time, you know, a couple of my friends were into it and would move Bitcoin back and forth. When some of the altcoins happened, we messed around with those a little bit, but we didn't do anything other than to like um, mess around, pay dinner, for example, um, pay each other back with crypto. Um, and so uh, that's where I really paused my investigation of crypto until um, later in my Mozilla years, I was approached by someone uh, that I hopefully everyone um, knows about, Sylvia McCauley, the founder of Algorand. Um, he's an amazing person in computer science generally, not just in the crypto landscape because of his uh, work in public key infrastructure, security, et cetera. So when he uh, wanted to, to chat, of course, I jumped at the opportunity. And uh, in his office, uh, I remember him explaining to me his thoughts around this idea he had around Algorand, a new blockchain. And every single thing he said, I'm like, yeah, I've experienced that particular problem with crypto already. It's like, this is, there's no way mining rigs make sense. There's no way like this kind of decentralization will work. Um, it's obviously too slow. All these, every single thing, bullet after bullet, I'm like, that totally resonated with me. So when given that opportunity to uh, join Algorand, this is two and a half years ago, um, I jumped in with both feet. Um, and uh, you know what I did is I stood the V1, the version one um, Algorand engineering team, 
Um, and then from there, I transitioned um, into uh, research and for, sort of forward-looking technologies, which I've been doing since the main launch of uh, June of 2019. Cool. So cool. Long, long-winded background, but there you go. No, I mean, it's, it's an amazing background, and it's, it's, it's really also fascinating to hear how people, you know, uh, get into crypto. I mean, most of the people have the same background story. I mean, similar background story. Yeah. I mean, almost all of us just started out with the mining and everything. I also spent a lot of money on GPUs then. And then <laughs> basically nowadays, thanks to you guys, I mean, uh, there's way more efficient and cool technologies, you know, emerging. Uh, I also got the chance to meet with Silvio. I mean, we did one, an interview on my channel with him. Uh, he, he's an amazing guy. I mean, uh, computer science and, you know, cryptology is not my field, but still, I mean, the, the knowledge he has is just amazing. And, uh, you know, I, I mean, I, I, I used, used to work as a product manager, and then we had this product management uh, triangle, you know, like you can't get a product like both fast and cheap and, you know, uh, high quality you can't get all three of them at the same time so crypto also had the same problem like you can't get scalability and then security and decentralization That's at right. the same time but it looks like i mean uh, from what i understood from silvio you guys actually nailed it so algorand is actually a scalable and secure and decentralized platform so uh, when we were doing our interview he told us that a lot of new cool futures to the platform was going to yeah. come by the summer so uh, could you tell us a bit about what you guys are building lately? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but once again, let me actually back up a little bit for some context. One of the really cool things about Algorand, actually, maybe the thing that sold me most on it, aside from the fact that we sort of solved that triangle, is uh, this idea of updates in the crypto world have always been a thorn. Uh, uh, and every single time someone has a cool, innovative new idea, um, in the past, it resulted in a hard fork. So you have problems like Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash, Ethereum and Ethereum Classic. Uh, and this uh, did not seem like a great way forward. Uh, if you're in product, you know, you need to be able to iterate your product as the needs evolve, as you understand um, the sort of domain a little bit better. Algorand, our pure proof of stake consensus mechanism supports upgrades as one of the things that it can agree on. Actually, it can agree on anything. 99% uh, of the time, it's a, a new block. But you know, in November of 2019, we used it to upgrade the network all 100% of all the value transition over. We added all these new features that we're really proud of. And uh, now we use that same mechanism. We're on the verge of our version three upgrade. I don't know what Silvio uh, um, may have, you know, let you know is coming down the pipe. So I'll just start with what's in uh, V3. So V3 builds off um, features that V2 introduced, um, including our layer one smart contracts. In um, version two, back in November, we, uh, wanted to focus on, in fact, our entire philosophy is we want a platform that stays to, to that um, three elements we talked about before, decentralization, um, scalability, and security. And when we say scalability, we don't mean, you know, 100 people or 1,000 people or even a million people. We mean world scale scalability. So our smart contract story um, is built in with uh, restrictions intentionally, um, so it can always run at full world scale speed. Uh, one of the things that we realized would be hard to do in our version one layer one smart contracts is have access to blockchain state um, that is not part of the transaction. An example of this would be if you and I are transacting value, our states are relevant, and so our so that one smart contracts can see that. However, you know Howard in the street over there, his blockchain value is not relevant, uh, and so it's not available. Um, that makes some sort of uh, things that you might want to do very hard. Um, and in the in sort of intervening months, our amazing engineering team discovered a way where we can get access to all the blockchains. Well, maybe not all a much of the useful blockchain state um, in a fast performant way. And um, that will be able to make available with our stateful smart contracts coming here in late August. So I think that's it's the first key, you know, big feature. Um, some other stuff that's coming down I think is really cool is in the blockchain world, there's this concept that's like a truism. There's this public key and this private key. The public key is associated with the account. It's the place where you can look to see how much money someone else has or who they are. Uh, and the private key is a spending key. I use that to authorize the transactions. That's great. And it's been provably useful for decades, basically, at this time since public key infrastructure was invented. However, it has some limitations. I can't sell my account. I could sell you assets in my account. I could sell you, you know, 
uh, if I have a NFT that represents the Mona Lisa that I obviously have it hanging on my wall right here, I could give that to you, but I couldn't give you the whole account with all the NFTs I have or all the balances that I have. Yeah. Um, the reason for that is like, if I sold it to you, the signing key would stay the same. It'd be like uh, you buying a house for me and I keeping a copy of that key and I can walk in at any time. It's not something that people want to do. With rekeying, we solve this problem. It's not possible to change the signing key for an account. And this can be really useful for long-lived accounts that are the account for a corporate entity, for example. Um, or if you want to sell account in the example I just gave. And there's many other ways that this could be useful because you can even use rekeying to change the, um, the rules. A smart contract could be the rule um, in the future to authorize access. So two of the sort of things coming on down the pipe um, that we're pretty excited by. And it's possible Silvio teased this, because this is, but this is further down the way. One thing I've been working on with the research team is um, off-chain smart contracts. Um, our smart contract story, as I mentioned already, is designed to have these limitations built in so it can always stay fast. And that is because it runs with the main blockchain, with the other transactions. And we don't want to be in a position where my attempt to compute pi to a million digits stops you from getting your salary for this month um, because that would be a problem. So uh, we came up with a new mechanism that we call off-chain smart contracts, something that we're hoping to land in early 2021. That's right, I'm trying to think what year we're in. And uh, um, this will allow you to run incredibly long computations, um, but the blockchain will facilitate the, I want to do this, and when the results are ready, they'll come back to the blockchain but the Algorand blockchain will still work at full speed at full scale without being bogged down by that really complex computation. Mm. Yeah, uh, that, that also sounds really interesting. So you said this is coming in 2021? That's right. Cool. Uh, I mean, like uh, the, all of this actually makes a lot of sense when you think about like enterprise problems and everything. I mean, like as an individual, I might not have a use case to actually sell my, my account, but as you said, if I'm running a, co a corporation and I, I have a smart contract, then it might make sense to you know, hand over everything properly. So, I mean, these are all exciting, but at the same time, since this is a really vibrant eco space, a lot of you know, part teams and projects are coming up with like really bright ideas. Uh, but then, again, there's also the problem of you know, dominance because, I mean, uh, Vitalik and Ethereum just came up with this you know, decentralized computing and smart contracts idea. I mean, it, it has a lot of drawbacks, but still, since they were first to the market, it's, it's the dominant platform, like everybody's issuing their tokens on e Ethereum without you know, questioning its security or like uh, speed. So uh, what do you think about the future of blockchain? I mean, uh, do you think uh, uh, tech like Algorand ever triumph uh, Ethereum, or do you guys are you guys gonna find out and figure out the way to you know coexist and you know uh, do an interoperability uh, futures? Great question, and I'll I guess I'll start by saying nothing I say is investment advice. I'm sure don't take it as such. Um, so <laughs> I think in in this world, you know, you have to um, always recognize that predicting the future is an impossibility. I think what we're trying to do is we are all trying to make the future. But what seems obvious to me right now is for the foreseeable future, there are gonna be many projects um, that are relevant. Uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum are relevant simply because of their scale and their user base and they were early on. Uh, so that's not gonna go away tomorrow. What happens in 10 years, who knows? But um, for the foreseeable future, I definitely see these uh, blockchains being around. The other thing is there's a lot of brilliant people out there with a lot of brilliant projects. And each of them take a new sort of nuanced approach to a particular type of problem. So I think it's completely possible that there will be a blockchain optimized for this and a blockchain optimized for that. For example, we're amazing at fast settlement, instant finality, so financial uh, projects make a ton of sense to come to Algorand. But maybe there's something that's better for the gaming world, you know, making something up. Um, but um, so I can totally see blockchain specializing that way. Um, however, assets are assets and value is value. And I think there will always be some sort of a um, exchange associated with these between the different uh, um, currencies and the different um, assets themselves. So interoperability is something that we are looking at very hard. Um, we're looking at it in a couple of different dimensions. There's 
I say easy, but there's the sort of the escrow style interoperability that comes from hash time lock contracts. I think all the big players want the ability to, for chain A and chain B to have the ability to swap assets between two players using something like that. But it's convoluted, it's complicated, and it's as weak as the slowest chain, as the most insecure chain. So it's not ideal. And new technologies um, that are um, being investigated, including um, stuff that we're doing here at Algorand, are these ideas of decentralized token bridges. Simply stated, a token bridge is um, you have value on chain A, I have value on chain B. We find a way to um, immobilize it on one chain um, and then dematerialize it so we can bring it over to the other chain in a safe way that's provable. Uh, the decentralization part's really important here because I could do that for Ethereum and Algorand myself. I could just say, hey, lock it, move it over, Who tr but who's gonna trust me to do that? Um, I'm a pretty honest guy, but you know, um, I'm, if you knew where I live, you could corrupt me simply by just walking over to me and say, hey, Navi, you know, I do this or else. Um, so decentralization, um, around token bridges is essential um, when big value is online. And um, one of the sort of research projects we're looking into is how do we facilitate that in a fast way where we, the benefits of both chains are preserved uh, for Algorand, you know, instant finality, um, four second block times, and possibly for Ethereum where a lot of value is locked up because of, as you mentioned, ERC-20 tokens tend to be there, um, Ethereum itself, um, is its own valuable commodity because of its ability to power smart contracts. Um, so these sort of interoperability features, I think, will spring up. Um, there's a lot of chains that, in fact, specialize in interoperability. Um, but I think, you know, you would need to bring more than just an interoperability. You need to bring your sort of nuanced view, your value, and then a way to interact with the rest of the community uh, to sort of power everything so the entire blockchain world is a little bit stronger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, you, you've actually came to a really important point uh, about like in the interoperability and having a decentralized medium to actually, you know, uh, switch value between blockchains. Because uh, I've been reading a lot about decentralized finance projects lately. As you know, there's this DeFi craze going on. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, as m more, uh, more I understand about how the tech works, the more worried I get. I don't know if it's because I don't, Fully understand it, or if I'm you know, smart enough to understand the risks involved, because like these guys are actually wrapping uh, other tokens into their platform. Like this, right. Bitcoin is a thing now, and, and that's actually really dangerous to me because like I don't know who's wrapping these bitcoins. I mean, who's keeping them safe? You know, what happens to that smart contract? How safe it is? So uh, I, I really want to hear your opinion about the, these DeFi projects. I mean, do you think that these people are building something meaningful, or is it just like the next crypto bubble? <laughs> uh, so let me let me take that from uh, my. Uh, my area of strength first, from the te technological perspective. I think the I'm fascinated by these derivative-based derivative products uh, where you take an existing asset and you wrap it with technology uh, in a way that you can now create a, a suite of assets. Um, and that uh, the suite of assets might be, um, for example, as you mentioned, wrap Bitcoin now on Algorand or Ethereum or on a different network. That's a simple product. A um, more complicated product would be where you um, wrap something that perhaps um, generates staking rewards. And the staking rewards continue to go to the original owner, but the new owner can now leverage that wrapped asset to, uh, to do something to um, buy a car you know, as a loan, um, where they pay back to the original owner. A lot of um, possibilities exist here. And I think you know, DeFi is a huge space. Uh, it's really seeking, I think, to replicate a lot of the functionality of the traditional financial world using um, crypto assets um, and sort of digital dematerialized concept. So when I say crypto assets, I don't just mean um, the wild crypto assets of, uh, that are not fiat based at all, like Bitcoin, Ethereum, Al the algo itself, but I also mean stable coins that could be pinned to a fiat um, a currency or even some of the new sort of uh, uh, things that are coming up down the way, like CDBCs, central bank digital currencies. Um, but all these things, uh, DeFi seeks to wrap and programmatically make available as new products. And from a technological perspective, I'm fascinated. I think that's a really cool thing to do. And I think there's some great research that we can do there to facilitate that. From uh, is it a bubble or is it real um, perspective? 
I don't have the answer. I'm not sure any of us do. Uh, I think uh, it's one of those areas where um, I personally am doing some amount of investigation, you know, putting my own personal you know, value uh, at risk to see what happens because uh, I'm, I definitely want to be part of that innovation and I definitely want to see some of that innovation succeed so we can have all this feature and functionality available to the entire world instead of to kind of the first world as it's um, more commonly placed. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, on that part, I, I agree with you 100%. I also want to see in, uh, innovation in the finance space, you know, fintech usually implementing blockchain, you know, coming up with more efficient solutions. And it's actually happening. Like, uh, there's the, one of the biggest private banks here, Turkish uh, Bank, was mm -hmm. actually super against crypto back in 2018. I mean, they were even uh, banning people. They were closing out their accounts just because they were trading cryptos. But wow. then there was this news last month uh, saying that Ishbank has uh, actually did his its first blockchain transfer with Deutsche Bank. I mean, like even these guys are doing the census. So, but the thing is, uh, I'd like to see innovation uh, after like a lot of R and D happening in a lab and then being introduced to the public. Uh, the thing with the DeFi right now is these people are experimenting with these derivatives. But uh, real people's money is at, at stake, you know. When I think that, that's that's kind of you know worrying worrying to me because like if things go bad, like imagine back in 2017, these there were a ton of shitty ICOs, right? Uh, when yeah. they went bankrupt, uh, they you know uh, erased a lot of wealth from regular people. But this DeFi thing, when it goes wrong, or if it goes wrong, it's it's going to turn into like a, a negative sum game because it's, it might also affect like all the value of the other tokens that they wrapped. You know, it, mm -hmm. it can be catastrophic. But I mean, that's a totally different subject. I'm not going to you know bore you to death with that. Uh, so l l let's get back to you know having traditional finance implementing. Yeah blockchain solutions because uh, you guys are also building really, really in interesting stuff back there. I mean, uh, I know for a fact that uh, Algorand is being utilized in a lot of CBDC pilot projects or even in some of the countries like Marshall Islands actually, you know, deployed this in real, you know, in the real uh, world use case. So uh, could you tell us about uh, what do you think of like how we should think about these stable coins and traditional uh, cryptocurrencies. I mean, uh, how do you see the future for CBDCs as such? Yeah, no, great question. And I, I think it's, you know, there's this duality, the um, cutting edge in the DeFi space and traditional brick and mortars coming to blockchain that make our world so exciting, more exciting 2020 than it's ever been before. Uh, the central bank digital currencies are something that they have been investigated for years at this point. But I think maybe the final sort of poke that um, amped up all these projects is Facebook was um, imminently about to release their own uh, stable coin. And prior to that, uh, crypto was a curiosity. But when a player as large as Facebook legitimizes the entire space with their, I think, 2 billion users and um, you know, I think half trillion dollar in market cap. It's yeah, that even it's even more. They have like three and a half billion users, including WhatsApp and like you know. Yeah, that's uh, you know insane. That's basically there's no country that can um, ignore that, even exactly. um, first world countries. And so as a result, they um, the central banks are looking um, at their central uh, the CDBC projects more seriously um, as a. Um, is there something they should do here uh, or at a minimum understand so they can participate in this new world, this new um, economic system where dematerialized cash will be a real thing? Uh, and what will that mean? And so there's an entire spectrum here. Uh, the spectrum is from like wholesale CD CBDC all the way to retail. Wholesale would be central bank to central bank, central bank to correspondent bank, just in that tight sector up there where everything is regulated and they all know each other on a first name basis. Um, all the way down to retail. And Marshall Island seeks to be a retail solution uh, where the central bank digital currency is actually held by individuals such as ourselves. And we can transact with that at the local market, you know, in the taxi, um, and hopefully as easily as we can with the PayPal's, the um, Venmo's, and the um, simple cash delivery systems and payment rails of today. Uh, so these projects are really exciting to me, but they're very 
much more legitimate than I think uh, uh, some of the other crypto projects because they come from institutions um, that um, have absolute authority in their domain. Uh, the central bank for a particular government has rule of law when they make a statement. And so when they say this will be how cash happens um, in you know, perhaps a country in Africa um, starting 2021, that will in fact be the rule. Marshall Islands, for example, um, that will be their only uh, currency. They're going to move off the U.S. dollar um, and then instead of building their own actual cash, um, their first currency will be a digital currency, the CBDC built on Algorand. Wow, wow. Yeah, I'm yeah, pretty excited by all that. Uh, you asked a, a separate question there that I think I missed and I think is really important is, so we have all these different kinds of currencies now, right? We'll eventually have central bank digital currencies, fully fiat backed and effectively cash. We have stable coins. Um, on Algorand, we have USDT, Tether, and uh, more recently announced USDC, Circle's uh, US dollar stable coin. And then of course the crypto assets themselves, the Algo, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and there'll be a whole slew of these, I'm sure, to come. Uh, having all these and uh, playing nicely is something that needs to be solved. Uh, and one of the piece of functionality that we, we turned on back in November that I think is really powerful here is atomic swaps. Atomic swaps means I can have um, USDC and you may have um, you know, a stable coin or a fiat currency from the Marshall Islands and we can locklessly swap them without negotiating in some sort of escrow account and worrying about counterparty risk. We could do that instantly in four seconds. Uh, but I think a lot of other tools are going to be built and a lot of technology will be built to facilitate these kind of exchanges because they'll become more meaningful. It's not just blockchains that will have to interoperate, but the currencies of the world that themselves will have to interoperate soon. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, we, we've also, uh, c c uh, you know, arrived at that discussion with Silvio, like, <laughs> Back. And he said that you know uh, more than like four percent of GDP of every nation is being wasted in these you know intermediaries in the you know uh, finance industry. So you know having these new tech like atomic swaps and like interoperability between blockchains, I think it's going to pro you know uh, add a lot of prosperity to a lot of you know uh, nations across. So I'm also really excited to see how this is going to play out. Uh, so. Yeah, I mean, that's, that brings us to the conclusion, I guess. That's, that's all the questions I have for you today. Um, I mean, again, thanks for, you know, waking up so early. <laughs> call. My pleasure. And I'm really looking forward to the future updates that you guys are going to build and launch on Al Algorand. It was a great opportunity to talk to you. Thank you. Oh, such a pleasure, as always. All right. Yeah, right. See you then. Cheers.